thank you all for joining tonight. My name is Ann Chang, uh, and I'm here with my partner, Karen Brown, um, and we are here for Smile Shares with, with Primary Care. Um, really exciting program tonight about lung cancer screening and lung nodule evaluation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as you know, this is our monthly um, lecture series that, that uh, Dr. Brown and I um, kind of put together, and it's really, really gone much further than I thought it was going to go. But uh, it's it's really, you know, there's a lot of information on, on cancer care and um, hematology, oncology uh, that is out there. There's so much happening. And, and this particular series is really focused on the perspectives of, of primary care. Um, and, and the way that, um, it's come about is that we have a faculty, uh, case, um, presentation, and this is actually, um, these cases have been developed through Dr. Banatowski's, um, speaking with the Smilo specialist, Dr. Blasberg and Tanui, and really trying to figure out what's the most important thing for you to know and what you want to know. So, uh, we always do try to have, um, that, that 10 minute question and answer period at the end. Um, so you always have great questions. So please try to, um, enter that in the chat. You can also enter it in the chat um, during the during the presentations so that we can make sure and hit those. Um, okay, so why don't we get started? Um, uh, you know, uh, we can skip this. Um, I have the the honor of of uh, introducing Dr. Tanui and Dr. Blasberg. T Dr. Tanui. Uh, is a professor in pulmonary critical care sleep medicine. She's also the vice chair for clinical affairs in the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, she trained uh, at, at uh, Yale. I mean, she got her medical degree from Yale and completed her internal medicine, medicine residency, chief residency fellowship here. Um, and she focuses on thoracic oncology and lung cancer screening. Um, she is a founding member of our multidisciplinary thoracic oncology program, and she's the director of the Yale Lung Screening and Nodule Program. Um, she is an active clinician, mentor, educator here, uh, and she's received lots of awards, including the LaFell Prize for Clinical Excellence, the uh, Department of Internal Medicine Faculty Achievement Award for Clinical Care, uh, among others. Um, and if you don't know, she also, uh, one of her contributions includes the founding of the Yale Medical Symphony Orchestra, of which she's a member and president of its board of directors. So thank you for that one. Um, Dr. Dr. Justin Blasberg is Associate Professor of Surgery, D Director of Robotic Thoracic Surgery here at Yale. He earned his um, degree from Albert Einstein and completed his cardiothoracic training at MGH in Boston. He's a board certified general surgeon and a board certified thoracic surgeon. Um, his practice includes minimally invasive and open in management for diseases of the esophagus, the lung, the mediastinum, chest wall, thoracic outlet, and diaphragm. He has a particular interest in benign and malignant disease of the trachea, um, including idiopathic laryngotracheal stenosis and post-intubation stenosis, as well as uh, complex lung resections requiring bronchoplasty. Um, he also performs first rib resection uh, and, and lots of varieties of, of, the, of um, uh, I guess, this anterior scalenectomy for uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, um, sympathectomy for hyperhidrosis, and minimally invasive chest wall reconstruction for pectus deformities. Um, he has a vision and passion for medicine, surgery, and improving the care of the patient. He leads a clinical research program on novel imaging techniques for the detection of lung cancer and surgical outcomes research in thoracic surgery. So we're really happy to have both of you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown to make any comments about this series and also to dis, um, introduce Dr. Banatowski. Thank you, Anne. And I just want to also extend a welcome to everybody who is watching now on or later to this series. It has been really terrific to be able to focus on the intersection of cases between primary care, whether that's at the beginning of an oncology diagnosis, a screening program, 
or the transfer of care after treatment is completed. Um, it's a special series, and I, I think one where I know I've learned a ton and am so glad to share it with all of you. I get to introduce Jill Banatoski. I was doing some math. I, I believe she and I have known each other for 30 years now. Um, Jill uh, is uh, an internist uh, in one of our NEMG practices in Westbrook, highly respected within the community uh, and by her colleagues, as well as the medical director uh, at the UNH uh, Student Health Program. She uh, is a graduate of UConn and did her residency at MGH Primary Care Residency Program um, and uh, since has been in practice here, uh, where I met her because she was also precepting residents in her office in the community. Um, she has many interests, including women's health, health education and prevention, uh, as well as uh, college health. Uh, and uh, this has served her, her patients well, um, and we also get to benefit from her wisdom within our primary care group, um, you know, at Northeast Medical Group and the uh, medical exec board at the Yale New Haven <laughs> Hospital. So I'm going to kick it off to you, Jill, and let you start our presentation. All right, next slide. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. And it, it's been a pleasure to work with uh, Justin and Lynn on this um, endeavor. I um, think you'll appreciate our lively discussion as we go forward. Um, we can't really start a lung cancer screening talk without really mentioning the hard work that's gone into the care signature pathway for lung cancer screening, which you can access from a variety of locations, but certainly most of us have the pathways tab um, bookmarked um, at the top of our EPIC. And this reminds us that the eligibility for lung cancer screening are for patients ages 50 to 80 who are current or former smokers, if the former former smokers, you must have quit within 15 years, and it's 20 pack year or greater smoking history. You also do need to document shared decision making, um, and there is a smart phrase for that, which we'll talk about just shortly. Diagnosis code that you can use for ordering is the code indicated on the slide, which is personal history of nicotine dependence. And the care pathway not only allows you to order directly from it, but as well takes you through some scripting regarding having that conversation with your patient about why they should be screened, the risks and benefits of screening, the elements of smoking cessation, including referrals to the smoking cessation clinic, as well as opportunities for treatment for smoking cessation, which is of course integral to this lung cancer screening process. Next slide, please. This lung cancer screening pathway, just reviewing here again, it does provide scripting a very, at the very beginning of the um, pathway. And it talks about making sure you inform the patient about discovery of findings that may not be cancer, but may result in additional testing. I've included here the SMART phrase um, that's in EPIC that satisfies the requirements for shared decision making. And as well, it takes you through all the elements of that, making sure the patient isn't having symptoms, making sure they've smoked for 20 pack years or more, um, discussion of willingness to participate and adherence to the program, um, and reviewing that it's a low, um, low dose lung cancer screening CT. Next slide, please. You can also launch the pathway from your EPIC health maintenance tracker, which we all use, um, and you can launch it from the bottom of the, of the pathway there. And we can talk about that once you've initiated a lung cancer screening CT in a patient, it will appear, will automatically appear in your EPIC health maintenance tracker. Next slide, please. And this just talks about how that occurs if you have a patient that is a current smoker and has smoked more than or equal to 20 pack years, it will automatically appear as a reminder to you to have that conversation with your patient and consider lung cancer screening in them. Um, if you order it, it will appear. And it also will give you the appropriate guidance in terms of follow-up care. So if a nodule is found or something that would require 
imaging sooner than an annual screening CT, that will also appear as a reminder within health maintenance. And there's been a lot of work with the pulmonary department, and uh, Lynn has been instrumental in this with um, Karen and Polly Sather in their department in terms of tracking patients. Um, they have a database of tracking patients and making sure that we all are doing our due diligence and that we're doing the appropriate follow-up for those patients. There's also an opportunity when we do order a lung cancer screening CT and EPIC, Polly's team, Polly Sather's team, um, will reach out to the patient to try to have an introductory conversation and make sure they understand and that we as primary care docs have gone through that shared decision-making model and asking, question, asking questions and answering questions of the patient. Uh, I'm just going to ask in this moment, Lynn or Karen, if there's anything you feel that we left out in that conversation. No, um, our team will talk to the patients and essentially do a decision support. Um, uh, if the patient seems like they didn't understand the original one that occurred. Um, and I think that they appreciate that. Absolutely. And it's nice to know, I learned that that's happening in the background, certainly from this, my participation in this um, webinar. Next slide, please. So our first case is really a bread and butter lung cancer screening question case. It's a 72 year old white female who has a history of well-controlled hypertension, hyperlipidemia, COPD, and already has one cancer um, associated with smoking being bladder cancer. She has a family history of colon cancer and a paternal aunt. There's, she does not have a family history of lung cancer. She has smoked 40 plus pack years and is still smoking and declines any smoking cessation treatment and is adamantly not interested in quitting smoking. So question going forward, which I think everyone can appreciate the answer is yes. Should this patient undergo lung cancer screening? Next slide. Okay. And now I'm turn it over to Lynn to go over lung cancer statistics. Great. I, I thought it'd be useful to um, do a little bit about lung cancer, just so you know the background. And by the way, thanks to everybody who's viewing this. I'm really glad you're interested. So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women uh, in the US. And it's actually the leading cause of cancer death around the world. In the world, about 2 million people die of lung cancer uh, every year. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, about 130 or so thousand people will die of lung cancer actually this year. Uh, the graph on the right shows American Cancer Society statistics of cancer death by site in men on the top and women on the bottom uh, since about 1930 when these statistics um, started being kept. And lung cancer mortality is the red line in men and the red line here in women. And you can see it is the leading cause of cancer death. And this graph really shows um, the epidemic of lung cancer that the country experienced between 1930 to about 1990 in men and later in women from about 1965, really to the present time. And fortunately the rates are coming down, but with 15% of the adult population still being very committed smokers like this first patient, uh, it's unlikely that they will come back down to what they were uh, in 1930. And I want to point out that uh, last year in the U.S. was the first year that there were more new uh, lung cancer cases in women uh, than men. And that is the beginning of a trend that's unfortunately likely uh, to continue. So the, the tide has turned in terms of this being a male-dominated uh, disease. When I was training to now, it's unfortunately spread pretty evenly. So if we look at five-year uh, survival rates, and that's kind of the gold standard for how do you do after um, you're diagnosed with cancer and treated, you can see that really over the past uh, 40 years that uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer have had really terrific improvements in five-year survival. 91% of women with breast cancer are alive at five years at this point, whereas lung has really lagged behind and so while uh, there has been progress made, still five-year survival for lung cancer all comers right now is only 23%. Um, there are a lot of reasons uh, behind the fact that lung cancer has lagged. 
but certainly one of them is that we haven't had a screening study, whereas uh, breast, colon, and prostate, the other three big uh, causes of cancer death in the country, have very well uh, embedded screening practices in, um, in the community. And those screenings are very widely accepted by uh, our patients. But I think that um, you really can see why early de detection is so important if you compare breast cancer to lung cancer. And so if we look at breast cancer, and this is what it is at present, about half of women are diagnosed at stage one and another third perhaps at stage two. So the majority of patients are getting diagnosed at early stage. And if you look at five years survival, according here to stage one, two, three, four, you can see that if two thirds of patients are getting diagnosed at uh, stages one and two, that the five year survival is gonna be great and you're gonna have fewer and fewer people diagnosed at advanced stage. The opposite, unfortunately, is true right now for lung cancer. So that stage one is this blue triangle here, maybe up to a quarter of patients are diagnosed at stage one and a few at stage two. And really three quarters of patients are diagnosed at stages three and four, where the likelihood they will get to five-year survival is pretty small. And so that if most patients uh, are diagnosed here at stage three and four, you can see why the five-year survival uh, for uh, lung cancer is so low. And so we really need early detection for lung cancer. And up until uh, the past 10 years, really, uh, that hadn't been possible. And so the National Lung Screening Trial changed all of that. Uh, this trial was published in 2011. It enrolled over 50,000 people who were randomized to either chest X-ray or low-dose CT scan. Um, to get in, you had to be ages 55 to 74 and have smoked at least 30 pack years. Um, and if you had quit, quit within the past 15 years. And I won't go into the details of the study, but the data that are important are shown in the graph on the right. And you can see that um, this is a cumulative number, number of lung cancers on the uh, y-axis and years since the randomization into the trial. And uh, many more lung cancers were diagnosed with low-dose CT than with chest X-ray, but when you look at the bottom panel, this is now the cumulative number of deaths, uh, fewer people died who were diagnosed with low-dose CT. And it, it turned out over the six years of this study, the cumulative risk of lung cancer was about 2.6%, and this was considered a high-risk population, so that's kind of anchored now. What we think about is high risk as about 2% risk over six years. And this study really proved that uh, screening with low-dose CT reduces mortality for, uh, from lung cancer and informed the United States Preventive Services Task Force, really landmark a recommendation to do lung cancer screening with low-dose CT uh, in 2013. And so the uh, USPSTF um, recommendations were actually updated in March of 2021. And the reason for the update was that it became clear there were a lot of disparities in screening. Um, uh, African-Americans and women tend to get lung cancer with uh, lower smoking exposure and at younger age. And so this change in the US PSTF recommendations uh, was made to um, uh, 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 acknowledge that and to try to address it. And so the current recommendations, which Jill already um, stated are adults ages 50 to 80 years who have a 20 pack year smoking history are currently smoking or quit within the past 15 years and they should be uh, screened with low dose CT annually. So uh, I wanted to give you all some tools that you can use uh, in your offices easily. And one of them is this uh, prostate lung colon ovarian trial um, prediction calculator for lung cancer risk. There's also a prediction calculator for a lung nodule risk. And if you take a screenshot here, you can actually go to this website and you can download, download this and use it. It's actually an Excel file and it's really easy um, to fill in numbers, which I did here for that patient. And so she's 70. I wasn't sure how much education she had. So I gave her a, a little bit of college uh, and a good BMI. She has COPD, which is the one, she's uh, Caucasian one, 
She's a current smoker of a pack of cigarettes per day for 40 uh, years. And when you put that all in, this calculator uh, gives you the possibility of lung cancer in six years, which in her case is 6.3%. So that's triple the risk of the high risk patient who's in the national lung screening trial. And so the number may not look big, but that is actually, she's at very high risk. And then one other uh, useful website that your patients can use, but you also can use is this, should I screen? Um, it's an interactive thing with the patient, but embedded in here is actually that uh, PLCO 2012 prediction calculator. So you can use this too. And that's kind of easy to remember. Should I screen? If you, if you punch that into your computer, it will come out. Um, this. And this is also a decision support tool. And so your patients can use that. And so Jill's absolutely right. You should screen this patient. She is at very high risk. Um, she's a current smoker and she's 72, but it sounds like she's in reasonably good health. And so she could be treated if it were necessary. So I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Thank you. So um, just to pick off from there, um, in this 72-year-old uh, female, history of smoking and a CAT scan that demonstrates a nine millimeter solid irregular nodule, um, it would be reasonable to take a deeper dive from a diagnostic perspective um, as recommended by lung rads, which is shown here on the screen right. Uh, this is a 4A lesion. If she hasn't had prior CT imaging, me meaning we don't really know if the nodule is new or if it's been there for some period of time, um, lung rads recommends either a short interval repeat CT scan in three months, which would be appropriate. Um, alternatively, I think based on one's clinical suspicion for lung cancer, or in this patient who had a history of a prior bladder cancer, evaluation with a PET scan you know, could uh, be considered. PET scan would give us some additional knowledge like is the nodule active, whether or not regional lymph nodes were active. And if, uh, if it was something related to the patient's prior cancer, uh, was there activity elsewhere? And so that was the diagnostic study chosen for this patient. Next slide. Not unexpected, the nodule was not active on the PET scan. This doesn't rule out the possibility the nodule represents a primary lung cancer. Doesn't rule out the possibility that this is a metastatic nodule from somewhere outside of the chest. But it does give us some indicator that this nodule isn't really a fast growing process. Doesn't zero in on whether the nodule could be cancer or non-cancer uh, entirely. But as somebody who evaluates nodules, you know, on a regular basis, and, and especially in patients with a history of smoking and with a prior history of malignancy, this metabolically inactive nodule does give me some confidence that I could follow up with shorter interval repeat imaging to evaluate whether or not there are changes in growth or, in, or nodule morphology. And then this helps us to make decisions about whether or not this uh, inactive nodule might in fact represent an early stage lung cancer. Next slide. So how do we figure out what's best for this patient? Uh, and then where, you know, there's a nodule that's not obviously benign, it's not obviously cancer, and the patient has these risk factors like smoking and prior cancer. Um, shared decision-making is often part of this process, making sure patients understand these options uh, and getting their input on how decisions are made. The nodule is suspicious, so getting a, a biopsy is a reasonable option. Get more information, less invasive than surgery, but potentially we don't get an answer. Uh, uh, and so uh, continued surveillance is still an option or even surgical resection is an option. In this patient, we talked about short interval repeat imaging, lung rads guidelines say three months, but even six months would be appropriate in this case. Um, do we see changes in size? Do we see changes in morphology? And therefore, should we consider more invasive options like the biopsy or even to resect a suspicious nodule? This patient felt strongly about continued surveillance, wanted a six month CT scan, which we obtained uh, and noted that the nodule in question uh, on the follow-up imaging was actually stable, if not slightly smaller. There was this sort of pattern of waxing and waning of lung nodules, which is not uncommon in our patients. Uh, that sort of speaks to an infectious or an inflammatory process, but still a patient that should be watched very carefully. And so we uh, continue with surveillance imaging uh, as of our last meeting with plans for a repeat chest CT scan in six months to make sure there were no major changes. Next slide. So I think in summary, is, is PET scanning the right choice? And I think in this case, it was reasonable understanding the limitations of PET scan, um, that there are uh, uh, less likely to be active, uh, that PET scans are less likely to show activity 
when nodules are on the smaller side like this, they don't rule out the possibility of cancer. They might light up for causes that are benign, which leads to biopsy or potentially even surgery for something that might not ultimately require surgery. But this is an important tool and just one piece of the data for us to consider in this workup. What should be the next step of about in evaluation of this patient? Um, I think we discussed close follow-up and repeat CT imaging. Um, patients should be evaluated by a pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon that's comfortable and familiar with dealing with dealing with lung nodules in a higher risk setting like this. And I would plan to follow up this patient and her nodules if they remain stable for at least two years from a nodule standpoint. And then um, she should continue to go on uh, and receive annual screening based on lung cancer screening guidelines for the foreseeable future. And I will pass the baton. Actually, before we go to the next case, why don't we interrupt and, and take the, the first couple of questions because they're really focused on the screening. Um, so uh, Dr. Zarku Power um, asked whether, uh, kind of what are success rates? Are there national benchmarks um, for what we should find for early stage one to two? Um, and how effective are we here? at detecting early lung cancer? For example, um, are there cases where one was missed and the next year it looks like stage three already? Um, you know, in terms of success rates, uh, that was really clearly demonstrated in the National Lung Screening Trial, but basically shown in every uh, lung cancer screening trial that you stage shift. So instead of maybe a quarter of patients being diagnosed with stage one, the National Lung Screening Trial um, diagnosed stage one lung cancer in over 60% of patients. And so that's probably the biggest success of early detection is that you find people early when the chances you can cure with you know, surgery um, or radiation, I guess, um, are high. Um, and that is what we observe. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there are patients where with their initial lung cancer screening study, we find a lung cancer that's not a stage one. You know, those patients are supposed to be asymptomatic when they're getting screened. And often when we see that, the patient actually was symptomatic, um, but perhaps just not saying, um, uh, not obviously. And so not everybody is diagnosed with uh, early stage disease through screening but certainly subsequent screens are more likely to find an early stage. It's actually much, much less common that lung cancers will move so fast that between one scan to the next, you know, one year, you'll find a cancer that has, you know, really gotten out of the barn. Uh, typical doubling time for a, a typical smoking associated lung cancers, generally about 100 days. And so only a few doubling times will have gone by in the course of a year. So yeah, we see the successes because we find people early. Thank you. And then the second question is uh, thanking you for the talk. Um, and in relation to uh, women of color, women uh, in the update, uh, including more people in screening eligibility, is there something else that we can be doing as clinicians to improve outcomes? Um, I think what we can all do is screen. The screening rate in Connecticut right now is less than 10%. Uh, we were getting to be about 12% and then the criteria changed in 2021, 22, and it doubled the population that's eligible. So immediately we went back to like five or 6%. And I think screening is not top of the mind for um, most people. You, you know, it, it's, it's one of the so many things that certainly primary care physicians have to keep track of. So I think tools like the health maintenance tracker where something's flagging you to, to do this are, are terrific. But I think that the thing we can do to improve outcomes the most is to screen, is to try to get the smoking history, put something in your offices that will make people think about it, offer patients tools like, should I screen? Um, so that hopefully they will bring it up to you in addition to you bringing it up to them. Thanks. Back to you, Joe. There was one other question in the chat, Lynn, which was, and Justin, that was, is there anything new in the understanding of the increased risk for lung cancer in young Asian women with no risk factors? Okay. 
Um, Justin, I'll take that one. Yep, go for so, it. There was a study in Taiwan, the talent study, and it really enrolled the, the like I don't know, thousands of cases, um, three quarters of whom were women. And in order to get into the talent screening study, you couldn't smoke. And what it turns out is that in that population of, it's really Taiwanese women um, in that study, but probably applicable to Asian women. And obviously I'm interested in this because I'm an Asian woman. Um, family history turns out to be uh, really important. Um, it's probably as important in that particular population as smoking. And so we do not have a recommendation in the United States or anywhere really that if you have a positive family history, you should be screened. It's probably not as strong a risk factor in Caucasians as it is in, in Asians. But I think that study has given all of us pause and, you know, unfortunately, uh, we aren't going to have a lot of big screening studies like the National Lung Screening Trial. That trial costs $250 million. And you can imagine that to try to do that sort of study in every population that might be a risk um, is, is just not going to be possible. And it really brings up this difficult question of if your patient doesn't meet the USPSTF criteria, what do you do? And and I think that, that is, that's a question that keeps coming up to USPSTF. And I think it's a very individual um, discussion you have to have with your patient. Um, it unfortunately raises the issue of disparities because some people will have you know, money to go buy a scan cheaply at a place you know, locally that is offering it um, uh, to people who don't necessarily meet criteria. And, and you can get that kind of scan in, in Connecticut. But it's not right that um, that, that then uh, increases the gap between people who have and people who don't have. But I think that was a really good question because it really points out that we need something beyond what we have now. And so biomarkers are probably where this field is headed and it's going there rapidly. Well, and I think that brings up what we've discussed previously, patients who have a significant smoking history, but are years and years, like they were women who stopped smoking because they were getting pregnant. But if the data had that we had known the data previously, they would have qualified, but now we're post 15 years smoking. And how do we treat those women? How do we get them screened? And the other question that's in the chat that is a corollary to this is, insurance coverage with regard to this? Is it universal? There are, some, are there some insurances that aren't covering it? How should we guide, give our patients guidance on that? So um, we could spend all night talking about this, but um, <laughs> Medicare, Medicare has to cover um, screening. And in Connecticut, Medicaid covers screening. That Medicaid doesn't cover it in all states, but it does in uh, Connecticut. It's really hard though, because if your patient doesn't meet the eligibility criteria set up by USPSTF, Medicare doesn't have to cover it. And since Medicare doesn't do pre-authorization, you don't know until the scan is done, whether it's gonna get paid for, which leaves us all in this, like, in this quandary. And then what about the patients who don't meet eligibility criteria? Um, in that case, some private insurers, and I can't tell you who, We'll, we'll let the patient have the scan if it's documented in the chart that the risk is high. And, and those scans get pre off And so generally you can actually then do the peer-to-peer -peer with, a, with a person. <laughs> um, and it might be you know a long discussion, but I think if you can show them that you've done due diligence and that the risk calculation is high and you've documented it in the chart, I think those have a, a reasonable chance of going through. Great, thank you, Lynn. So the next case um, will take into account the concept of a cardiac calcium CT scan and uh, incidental findings on that. So a 76 year old woman with hypertension and hyperlipidemia feels great, she takes a tenolol, she's declined statin therapy and she exercises regularly. She drinks four glasses of wine a week, smoked when she was growing up in France with an estimation of 25 pack years. And similar to what we were just discussing, she quit in 1978. 
Family history is significant for vascular disease and her parents. Brother had cholangiocarcinoma. She has an unremarkable exam and no symptoms. She's a snowbird and her physician in Florida convinces her to have a coronary calcium CT scan for risk stratification. And her scan shows a coronary score of zero, but a three millimeter right upper lobe nodule and a calcified granuloma in the left lower lobe with a thin nematocele in the right middle lobe. So follow-up recommendations regarding these findings. Next slide. Okay, so I'll take the baton back. Yes, thank you, um, Lynn. So this patient fits uh, the Flesh and Society guidelines for management of incidental pulmonary nodules. And I'm sure that we've all seen our radiology colleagues quoting the, the Fleischner uh, guidelines when they're re reporting out on this kind of nodule. And so um, this is a really little nodule. There it is over there. Okay, you can barely see it. And, and so the Fleischner guidelines were really set up for this purpose because about 15% of, of, of people on any CT scan will have at least one nodule. And so they're just so many of them, millions and millions of them. And so the radiologists really needed a, um, like lung rats for um, screening uh, low dose CT. They needed an algorithm so that they wouldn't have to think about this to a certain extent, but also to follow a standard procedure so that um, there was consistency in the recommendations that were you know, evidence-based. And so this person has a nodule that's less than six millimeters up here, a solid nodule that's less than six millimeters. It's low risk and you really don't need to follow this. It, it is low enough risk that nothing uh, needs to be done. And most of the nodules that are discovered incidentally in this way fall into that category. And I'm not going to walk through the entire Fleischner guidelines, but you can with confidence tell this patient she doesn't need follow-up for that. So that I won't walk again through the uh, Fleischner guidelines. The one thing is that we only use this for uh, patients who are over the age of 35. And as with all things, if there is something in the history that makes you worry, you can always do a follow-up. But again, this um, those guidelines were set up to eliminate um, scans that didn't need to be done. And I think I follow this and it's, it's a really useful framework. And so if we go back to um, uh, this patient uh, and we put her through the uh, PLCO uh, 2012 uh, model, not for the nodule, but, but for her lung cancer risk, she comes out to a risk of 1.4. And so that's lower than the National Lung Screening Trial average. It was in, in that um, study, the range of risk was 0.5 to two, actually 0.5 to like almost 10, I think. Um, and so her risk is lower than the average of the NLST, but it's not zero. Um, and I think that Will she qualify? Well, she's Medicare age. Is Medicare going to pay for a low dose CT scan if you order it? Probably not, because you wouldn't be able to check the box that says that she quit smoking within the past uh, 15 years. Would you screen her? I think a lot of us would want to screen her, um, but we run the risk of it might not get paid for. In all honesty, I would tell this patient she has more risk, obviously, than if she'd never smoked, and she did accumulate a fair amount of smoking uh, when she did smoke. So that uh, one thing is that um, uh, uh, the CT coronary uh, studies are not complete chest CTs. And here is her coronary uh, scoring CT um, on the left. I hope you can see my pointer. And you can see that pieces of the lung are cut off. But the most important thing is this is as high as that scan went. And so this is the most superior uh, CT cut of, the, of that scan done for calcium scoring. Here's her heart. And so we're, we're at the level of the heart. So we're missing the whole top half of the uh, chest. Uh, if you know bronchial anatomy, this is the right bronchus intermedius, and this is the end of the left main stem. Um, and 
Um, and so we are getting a very incomplete look uh, at the lungs here. And um, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip and do this one line. This patient's uh, primary care physician ordered another CT um, a year later, ostensibly to follow up on the three um, millimeter nodule that had been identified on that other scan. And there was a new nodule identified in that following year. It's on the other side of the lung and it's well above the level of the coronary uh, calcium scoring CT. And so that you cannot substitute a coronary calcium scoring CT for a chest CT, and you can't use it as a lung cancer screening study the way they are done now because it is an incomplete study. So Jill, I'll pass it back to you, <laughs> or I think maybe Justin is doing this. Perfect, thank you. So uh, as, you, as you said, uh, based on that coronary CT, or at least the patient's underlying risk, uh, the PCP appropriately ordered that dedicated CT scan. This showed a 1.8 centimeter nodule. In addition to other nodules that were smaller, a PET scan was obtained at that time. The nodule is not very active and not uh, unexpected. These smaller nodules were also not very active. So I spoke to the patient about getting a biopsy at this point because of her smoking history and the appearance of this nodule. It, it was pretty suspicious to me, so, but she really preferred continued follow-up. Uh, initially, we recommended a three-month follow-up, but I think because of her travel obligations, we ended up getting a repeat CT scan at six months. This is September of 2023. The nodule had grown a little bit, not quite in its largest dimension, but it was a little bit bigger in other dimensions, and some other nodules uh, were present as well, although these appeared to be fairly similar. Yeah, I, I was uh, concerned about the nodule. I ordered her for a new PET scan. This is October of 23. And now instead of an SUV of 2.1, we were dealing with something that was a little bit brighter, a little bit more concerning, uh, and really much more compelling as an early stage non-small cell lung cancer based on uh, just these diagnostic tests alone. Next slide. You know, this is a pretty consistent story for evolution of a lung nodule like this over time. It makes it challenging, um, especially when there are small and subtle changes to really differentiate nodules that could be infectious or inflammatory compared to early stage lung cancers. This nodule is more solid than we saw in case one. The edges are more irregular, and I think not unexpected, there's more pet activity in the center. Uh, next slide. So, you know, initially my impression was this 1.8 centimeter nodule appeared consistent with an early stage, stage 1A2, uh, early, so sub two centimeter lung cancer. There were some other non-specific lung nodules measuring seven millimeters. They appeared to be Maybe they were related, maybe they were unrelated. Uh, we'd seen some change on follow-up imaging. The PET scan had some mild activity, but not anything of significance. The lymph nodes that drain that area um, didn't appear to be abnormal in size or have abnormal activity. And then, so, you know, therefore, I, you know, I thought it was reasonable for us to discuss the risks and benefits of surgery and the alternatives, uh, continued surveillance, uh, the, the opportunity for a biopsy pre-surgery or just to remove this area. Um, the patient had excellent performance status. She had excellent lung capacity and so forth. And so based on the fact that we were really concerned about this nodule, that it appeared to be localized and she was a, a, an appropriate risk candidate for surgery, we proceeded to the operating room. Unfortunately, in the operating room, we found some unexpected findings, namely that there wasn't just uh, a nodule in the right lower lobe uh, or the left lower lobe, I'm sorry, but that there were pleural implants on both the lung surface and the chest wall surface that appeared to be consistent with metastatic disease. Um, so these were biopsied and they were profiled. We looked for mutations that were actionable. And in fact, she did have an EGFR mutation, which we see in about five or 10% of our patients. She was referred to medical oncology and she was placed on osimertinib, which is a targeted therapy for EGFR. So unexpected findings uh, from this patient and what we thought was a stage one lung cancer turned out to be actually in fact a stage four A process, which is unfortunate. I think, next slide, yeah. I think some takeaway points from this case, uh, Fleischner guidelines are applicable to patients over the age of 35 where a lung nodule that's identified on a CT scan for an unrelated reason. Uh, uh, this, this is a, a common language we share with radiologists and across disciplines for understanding nodule severity or concern, even across institutions, this 
should remain valid in the sort of universal language in this world. We can also see clearly from this case that coronary CT scans, as, as Lynn had mentioned, we don't see everything. They aren't formatted to see lung nodules in the highest possible resolution. And so when there's an opportunity or an abnormality identified, a dedicated chest imaging should be uh, considered at least. Um, so a, a, a couple of questions listed here, and I think we covered the uh, the second one, but we'll I'll just run through it. So uh, do calcium uh, coronary calcium CTs that identify a lung nodule require a follow-up chest CT scan? Uh, at least the way that I think about it, I would say the answer depends. It depends on the patient's risk factors for lung cancer. I think their occupational or environmental exposure, uh, and in many cases, we're getting a, we're getting follow-up CT scans. 20% um, of our lung cancer population are in never smokers. They wouldn't have met criteria for lung cancer screening in addition to remote smokers and some of these other things. So I think it depends on, on the patient, but in a lot of cases, it makes sense to carefully document and to um, thoughtfully order dedicated chest imaging. And that really touches on the second part, which Lynn also um, stole my thunder on answering that question. And I think that is if you... Um, if you, uh, you know, carefully document the rationale for dedicated chest imaging, I think in general, at least in, on the surgery side, we've been, been able to get those scans covered. Do you wanna stop for questions or shall we keep going? I think before we go on, I think this comes up a lot and is really a, a question that we have all the time in primary care, which is it it is often commented on not just on the coronary calcium CT scans, but also on abs CTs that get the the ba the lung bases and there's a tiny little nodule. And I think the the cautionary tale in terms of women having an increased risk of um I was finding lung cancer in women who are non-smokers. Um, who may or who may have a much less um, smoking exposure in the past, Sh should all of those women, should all of those patients get a full chest CT? And when should we do that? Because we'll often say a year, consider a chest CT in a year. Should it be at that time? Should we be doing it in six months? Should we be doing it in a year? When should we look at the full lung Justin, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I I, I would say um, it is it's hard to give um, high level guidelines that that um, that will capture good recommendations for all patients. I guess what I, I would be happy to um, look at those CT scans and give you an opinion and then make a decision from there. I think it, it is very challenging, but I would say even just some starting recommendations would really sort of touch on some of the risk factors that we've talked about tonight. Uh, whether the patients had a smoking history, whether the patients had a family history of lung cancer, what their occupation is, what their environmental exposure might be. And, and I think that really sort of does touch on a lot of what would then lead to a reasonable recommendation for dedicated imaging. I, I would I would error to say it's better to over image than to under image uh, in, in most patients. Um, but I also think it's it's reasonable for patients with suspicious nodules to refer them to our nodule program and for us to follow them uh, and, and make recommendations. I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, when you do the coronary calcium scoring CT, you're thinking about one thing. And if you see a nodule, you start thinking about different things and you would take a different history from the patient. And so that a, a separate discussion, once you find a nodule may um, lead you down the path of you're reassured and you don't have to order a CT or you're more concerned and then you would order it. Um, so that I think that going back to the patient and thinking about lung cancer and taking that history um, may change or may actually really influence what you do about ordering another CT scan. Thank you. There's also a question in the chat about why the screening criteria doesn't include a family history of lung cancer. And I assume that has to just do with what the trials used. That That's right. When um, USPSDF was considering the update, um, both major pulmonary societies um, sent you know, letters with tons of signatures saying you should use the risk calculator as the, as the entry into screening. Um, because there are people who smoke and have very low risk and there are people who don't smoke and they have all these other risks. 
um, and family history is included in the calculator. And USPST have made a conscious decision not to do that based on, if you read the supplement of the supplement, that they couldn't um, land on, on what's the risk threshold above which you would do the screen. These are, you know, the, this is going to be iterative. Uh, USPSTF will reconsider in a few years, probably. And at that point, I think there may be more data about things like family history based on studies done elsewhere in the world. Okay. Great, thank you. Next slide. So this is our last case. Um, Jill, did you want to do this? Or do you want sure. To do sure. I'll so this is a 60-year-old man with a history of well-controlled diabetes and hypertension who establishes care with a new PCP. He has no pulmonary symptoms, but review your careful review of his records reveals that he had a coronary calcium CT scan with a score of zero from a couple of years ago, but had an incidental two centimeter left upper lobe lung nodule for which there has been no follow-up. He's a lifelong non-smoker. Um, no family history of lung cancer and no exposures and an unremarkable exam. And I believe as this case goes, this patient actually ended up going to biopsy and then ended up in Dr. Tanui's clinic. <laughs> Next. So um, this is the, these are the patient's images. And so this is um, the um, coronary calcium scoring study. And you can see, again, this one is, the lung is really cut off here, but there was, this very visible solid nodule in the left lung and for whatever reason, it was not, not identified to the patient for sure. I don't know what the situation was with why he wasn't told. Um, and so um, he got this new primary doctor who uh, saw that and got a follow-up scan. And this nodule actually had gotten a little bigger and it had developed a cavity. Um, Meanwhile, the patient was rather shocked about this and was feeling fine. He had a PET scan and you can see that there is some uptake in that same area, not intensely, but certainly not um, negative. Um, so that uh, the situation was the history as Jill said, and with the imaging that I just showed you, he underwent a CT guided needle biopsy pretty close to that CT scan, to the PET scan, which showed nonspecific inflammation and no evidence of malignancy. And on the basis of uh, the biopsy, the decision was made to wait and, and see what happened. Um, but um, the patient was not like super thrilled with that um, recommendation because he had gotten really concerned that he had lung cancer and really this kind of biopsy with nonspecific findings is a non-diagnostic um, biopsy and doesn't get you out of the woods in terms of your concern that there's something bad going on in there. And so um, he actually insisted that he get another CT scan and you can see that this nodule got bigger and was the cavity had gotten uh, much bigger. And for these things, you have to measure from edge to edge. And so if you do that, you can see how much it had grown over the span of six months. He was still feeling fine and actually not having symptoms, but was now really concerned about the possibility of cancer. This sort of lesion is very hard to biopsy because the solid part of it, which is the wall, is super thin. Um, so that trying to go in again with the needle would be difficult. You probably end up inside the cavity and going at it with the bronchoscope also uh, is sort of problematic because if you biopsy that edge, it's probably full of blood vessels and the chance of bleeding from that kind of biopsy is quite high. So one thing is that, you know, um, not all nodules are cancer. And I certainly experienced that when people see that word on their scan reports, or they're told they have a spot on the lung, they immediately, their head immediately goes to, I have a lung cancer. And it's important that we remember all the other things that a nodule can be. Um, there are other cancers that can cause nodules in the lung uh, besides lung cancer, metastatic from another primary lymphoma. And there are lots of infections that can cause uh, nodules that cavitate. And I guess this is the, I wrote this differential for cavitary lung nodules, and in particular, um, fungal infections, mycobacterial infections, uh, lung abscesses, and even parasitic infections. 
And then inflammatory diseases like um, uh, GPA, RA, sarcoid, and, and cystic lung disease. And so I always try to go through that differential because if I don't do it, I'll miss the person who doesn't have the lung cancer. And so there was really not much choice for this patient. Whatever was going on was progressing and we had no diagnosis. And so he actually had a left lower lobectomy uh, last month and that showed necrotizing granulomatous inflammation with budding yeast forms. And so this is a fungal infection and we still don't actually know which fungus this is, but you know, as we were talking about, you bring the patient back and you take another history now with more information in hand. Uh, he had been born in Pakistan. He had moved to the US as a young adult. He's lived all over the country in, in, including in places where there is endemic uh, fungus like the o Ohio River Valley. He's currently living in upstate New York. And then it turned out that what he like, likes to do on the weekends is he goes to New Hampshire with his wife and he crawls around caves. And so um, I think this is histo based on the cave thing, live in Ohio, and there's histo around the world. Um, if he had lived in Arizona and played golf in the desert, this would have been, you know, coccidioides. Um, so that the story is still out on this patient, but it was a really good reminder that not everything that looks like lung cancer is uh, lung cancer. And so we really should not make assumptions. We can get the data and give people, you know, real diagnoses. Should I do this or is somebody else doing this? Go for it, Lynn. Go for it. Okay. So, so the most important thing I want you to take away is screen your patients for lung cancer. Um, you know, we're, we really have got to get better at this if we want to take advantage of the fact that we have a tool now to diagnose people early. Uh, please go online and download the prostate, lung, colon, ovarian uh, risk calculator, I think that you will find it useful. And once you've downloaded it, you can be, you can stay on your uh, computer desktop forever. You know, we've talked a lot about if you, if your patient has risk, but doesn't meet the USPSTF uh, eligibility criteria, you know, talk to them. You may find something else in their history that either reassures you or makes you uh, more worried. And, um, you know, they do need to understand, particularly the Medicare population that if you order the scan, Medicare may not pay for it. And uh, I keep in my back pocket the knowledge of which places in the state of Connecticut charge the least amount of money uh, for scans, and that keeps changing. Um, but there are places that offer those low-dose CTs for relatively um, inexpensive uh, cost. When you're talking to your patients about lung cancer screening, those are teachable moments. You, they're listening to you about lung cancer, and you may um, want to take advantage of that um, to talk to them about uh, smoking cessation. We talked about the fact that a CT done for coronary scoring, scoring doesn't include the whole lung and cannot be used to replace lung cancer screening. And always consider the whole possibilities of what that nodule can be, even if your head goes straight to lung cancer. And Justin, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything to that list. No, I think you covered it. Um, I think we, the three cases really encapsulate sort of uh, how I spend a lot of my day. And um, and uh, this is a really important topic. And, uh, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank this panel and everybody who attended tonight for, for hearing about it. It's a, it's a great discussion. I think if you um, advance to the next slide, that just is a reminder for folks to complete the survey um, at the at after this ends so that you can get the CME credit. And I think there was a question in the, in, if you ever don't have an issue, then feel free to don't get CME credit. You can email me or, or Karen and we can make sure that you get that. Um, and we have bladder cancer coming up in April and breast cancer in May uh, with our very own Karen Brown. Um, I think we have to, this has been fantastic. Um, Karen, any comments? We want to certainly thank you all for attending in our in our faculty. Go ahead, Karen. I was just going to say, I, I thought this was absolutely wonderful. This is something that we think about all the time and to have just spent some time to go through some of the issues and, and to hear 
uh, from Lynn and Justin with all of their expertise will make us stronger doctors, clinicians, and we really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It was fun. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.